those of the, you that don't know me, my name's Andy Hirons. I'm actually currently just traveling around the world with my wife, and this is just a happy coincidence that I've been able to come and uh, give you guys a bit of time today. And uh, when I'm not traveling, I, I'm a lecturer in arboriculture at Myersco College, which uh, delivers arboricultural programs from further education. So if you like the sort of school leavers, 16 year olds, right through to a master's program in arboriculture and urban forestry. And we do that both online and full time as well. So we have students all around the world. So it's really helpful for me to come and get a bit of an Australian perspective. Um, I guess in, in many ways, my career started here. I came uh, about 13 years ago to work with uh, Arbico, Dave Caldercott and his group as a student. And they gave me a brilliant foundation in arboriculture and what it could mean. And I suppose, well, 13 years later, I'm here hopefully sharing some of the things I've picked up in the preceding decade. I've started here um, with a shot of the urban forest in Ho Chi Minh City. And I quite like this shot because it actually describes and illustrates quite nicely what we're dealing with. We're, we're dealing with a whole range of trees in different urban scenarios. It always frustrates me when people talk about urban trees or urban soils. And actually, we're talking uh, about a, a whole spectrum of different things. You can see there isolated trees in courtyards, you can see street trees in paved sites, but you can also see a parkland environment and garden environments. And there's very, very different uh, contexts in which trees are found within the urban environment. So the first talk I want to deliver is on the establishment of trees and some of the things that we can do to aid the establishment of trees. And then we'll have a bit of a break. You'll probably all need it by that stage. And uh, then after the break, we'll come back and talk a little bit more uh, in detail about root management of established trees, or trees that are, are in situ, if you like. Uh, so I haven't got a, a watch. So Shane, where's Shane, can you give me like a 10 minute warning or five minute warning or something? Great. Um, OK, I thought I'd start right at the beginning, if you, if you like. And the earliest evidence we have for transplantation of trees comes from ancient Egypt. Thousands and thousands of years ago, uh, the Egyptians used to go over to uh, well, a land called Punt, which is now the uh, Horn of Africa, Somalia region, uh, to collect incense from the trees there, which was very important for their burial rituals. So Boswellia um, species and so on. And they soon realized it would be much better if they actually just took the trees back to Egypt and they could you know, get the incense there. And so there's this big expedition that is immortalized on, on some of the um, uh, reliefs within uh, the, the ancient areas of Egypt uh, that show in 1550 BC, or around that area, an expedition to this, what is now Somalia to bring back these ancient, uh, the, these incense trees for their, for their burial rites. So we've been at tree transplanting for a long time, yet uh, it, it seems sometimes that we don't even get the basics right, given, given the fact we've been doing it for, for thousands of years. What, what we're really interested in doing is, I think uh, Greg even alluded this, is turning turning the drawings into reality. It, it's, it's pretty easy, actually, to find some lovely uh, computer-generated drawings from landscape architects of mature trees on wonderful new developments. But what often happens is that they look great on day one when they hand over the contract, but 10, 20, 30 years later, the infrastructure hasn't been there to support the, the uh, trees, and they've died out long before uh, they've ever got to the standard that they re received in, in the drawing. And, and it's, a, it's a constant frustration, I think, for arborists that we're not included at an earlier enough stage in the development process to really impact that design. So we're interested in how we turn those drawings into reality. And just to, you know, along the way, to illustrate the point, we have all sorts of scenarios that you will recognize. You know, I, I spend a little bit of time walking around Melbourne, and I can see plenty of trees like this that are in compacted sites, that are competing with grass, that are um, you know, still tied up 
long after the t ties and support should have been removed, and so on. There are all sorts of things that can contribute to the failure of urban trees. And if we look at the progress that we may have made, perhaps since those early Egyptian days, there's a bit of a, a, a time gap in my, in my line there, but we'll pick it up for, at 1990 and through to the, um, you know, about five years ago. We've done various uh, assessments in the UK and consistently we find that somewhere between 10 and up to 80% at an average of about 25% of our trees that we plant within the landscape fail within the first th uh, few years. And that's a devastating statistic, really, isn't it? You can't think of any other industry that would accept that sort of failure. You know, if, if the brake manufacturer or the lighting manufacturer or, you know, the engine manufacturer had a 25% failure rate routinely, they would simply be out of business. It wouldn't be accepted. And yet we somehow accept that level of failure within our urban trees. And the frustrating thing is we actually know how to do it properly. It's not rocket science. It's not, you know, trying to um, get to the moon. It, it really is pretty straightforward if you follow some basic principles. And the, the best evidence we have is that trees within urban areas reach between 19 and 28 years. Now, I always uh, think of about stats like that with a little bit of scepticism because it's clear, isn't it, that there are plenty of urban trees that are way over 30 years old. But on average, uh, our mortality rates and, and the life expectancy of urban trees is, say, maximum of 30 years, and yet we know that the specimens in the wild will be growing on for, you know, certainly decades longer than that, probably centuries longer than that in many cases. So what are those fundamentals? I think for me it really boils down to four key points and, I, I, and there's sort of some sub points under there and I'm going to explore some of those in a little bit more detail with you this morning. One is tree selection, getting that right and we can look at um, various elements of tree selection, the constraints of the site, the ecophysiology of the tree if you like, if it's adapted to drought or cold tolerance is a bit more of a problem in the northern hemisphere but not so much here. Um, the aesthetics, functional properties, and so on. The rooting environment, not surprisingly, I'm going to explore some of those elements a little bit more today. The design of the rooting environment, engineering the right solutions for that, the volume of soil. We can actually specify soil. How many people actually specify the grade of soil that they want on their planting schemes? In the UK, we have a British standard for topsoil that you can use in, in um, landscaping programs. Uh, but you can, you can, to some extent, write your own. And the ecology of the soil that I know is going to be picked up on a little bit later as well. Uh, the, the quality of the plant and the arboricultural practice. You take any one of those elements away and you've got much, much higher likelihood of failure. It's no good having a fantastic plant in a really crappy hole. It's no good uh, having... Uh, th spending tens of thousands of dollars on getting the root environment fantastic and having a really cheap plant that's, you know, inadequate and will likely fail anyway. So e equally, you can mess up a really good plant um, by planting it incorrectly. So all of those elements are really, really key to getting trees established within our urban environments. In fact, you know, even in gardens and parks and more generally. So by way of a little gentle introduction, I, I thought let's just r remind ourselves what those key soil functions are. Primarily, of course, the provision of resources, water, nutrients, oxygen and so on, physical support. But they also act as a vital habitat for uh, a variety of uh, microorganisms and fungi and so on uh, that are really key for cycling of nutrients um, and the absorption of nutrients in many cases as well. And we would typically, if you look at the sort of horticultural textbooks, they would generally have a composition of soil that would look something like 5 to 10% organic matter, 45% mineral matter, if you like, and then 25% air, 25% water. That's what they would say would be the ideal soil. There's certainly a lot of variation around that. But if you aim for that, that sort of uh, composition, then you're not doing uh, too much wrong. In terms of the roots then, 
Well, we, we think all the time, don't we, about the ability of roots to be able to uptake nutrients and anchorage, but often there's a lot of other elements to the root biology that we, we forget. The, the fact they need to be conduits for the, the water from the, the root tips, the fine roots, through to the, the stem and the canopy. They are really vital organs for the storage of um, starches and other sugars that can be utilized in, in times of trouble. They're a bit like the sort of investment or the, the, the savings account of the tree from a carbon point of view, but they help regulate growth as well. There's a l series of um, phytohormones that are produced within the root system that then have a action of some description on the canopy. And they provide a habitat and, a and also they provide chemicals that are capable of modifying a soil. I think we might be picking up on some of those elements a little bit later on in the day. One of the interesting studies I've come across recently uh, was a meta-analysis done by a guy called Henrik Porter who took uh, a whole load of pot experiments from plant biologists all over the world and he looked at the the impact of the pot size on the results. And it was really quite interesting that on the right hand side you can see a, a couple of, um, they're actually, uh, one is um, barley, one's uh, sugar beet. Um, and the blue roots you can see are, are what's in contact with the outside of the pot. Okay, So you can see within a month or so, six weeks, you get roots uh, right to the outside of the container and potentially being restricted. And the impact was really quite significant. So the graph there on the left-hand side, we can see that the, on average, this is if they doubled the pot size, they got a 43% increase in biomass. And there's no significant difference between woody and herbaceous species. So we know that size is greatly restricted by the rooting volume that uh, it's able to have, uh, and the reason for that primarily is the reduction in net photosynthesis. Okay, so it's a really interesting study. Yes, it's in pot plants, and sometimes we can get kind of distracted thinking that kind of highbrow science stuff isn't relevant to us, but actually this is really good evidence across a whole range of species that pot size matters, that rooting volume matters to the size of the plant. And what's actually important is the plant mass per unit rooting volume that's relevant, not necessarily just a root. You can <laughs> put a small root in a really big pot and you know that's not really what we're testing. So we're looking at the plant mass per rooting volume that's really relevant. So if we take that out to the street, so to say, what we have is this idea. The, the image on the right, you can see that the right-hand tree is really close to that planting bed, got access to a much higher, um, much larger rooting volume. And then as we move from right to left, we can see the trees get progressively smaller as they have a lower percentage um, of their roots within that larger rooting volume, they become more restricted. You can see the impact of that there. And they were, of course, planted at the same time in that particular development. So that we, you know, we don't need necessarily science to tell us that. You can just go out and have a look in car parks. Car parks are great you know, because they've got all sorts of trees crammed into funny places, but often around the margins and, and, and they, they've got trees that are closer to bed. See if they're any bigger or doing a little bit better than the ones that are perhaps a little bit further over. And we know that we can increase the the soil volume through various mechanisms. I mean, one of the recent books that have come out through the ISA is by a guy called James Urban. M some of you are probably familiar with his work. He's come up with a whole series of, of things and interventions that you can do to improve soil volume. One is, is root paths, sort of illustrated there. Um, we can sort of elaborate those a little bit, get root trenches. Uh, so you, you might have, for example, in, in this example, a, a, a tree opening of uh, 140 cubic feet with the soil trenches offering another 310 cubic feet, so you end up with 450 cubic feet. So there's ways we can engineer um, below ground infrastructure to improve those roots. Uh, soil vaults is another option, just vault, vault the tree in and maybe just treat it as a temporary commodity, a bit of urban infrastructure that you can replace every... Uh, 
um, 20 years or whatever. That, that is, that's an acceptable thing to do in some circumstances. Or perhaps structural soils uh, and, and trying to elaborate uh, the root volumes using soils that will take a, a load. Uh, or, or a hybrid system that combines all, all several of those approaches. In the city of Stockholm, there's been some really interesting work done with what they call planting beds. Well, really, these are uh, quite extensive beds that use a, a type of structural soil, really quite large rock fractions, um, so that they can extend the root systems. And it's been really very successful. You can see there um, the sorts of, of avenues that they've had planted. So underneath that flower bed was a lot of uh, structural soil. Um, I say structural soil, it's really very variable material, so <laughs> you have to look at the fine detail because not all structural soils are equal, that's for sure. But they have found really good tree establishment using that, and if you want um, to have a look at that process, there's quite a nice YouTube video of them doing that. I was going to play it today, but it's, it's a little bit lengthy and didn't want to get distracted. And there's this handbook that you can download, so if you just um, Google planting beds in the city of Stockholm, you can do that. But the only thing I would say is turn the volume down because it's got the most hideous soundtrack you can ever imagine. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you turn the volume down, it's a really informative um, handbook and, and little video clip that's associated with that. And, and that's just one of the many, many international examples of trees that have been successfully installed with structural soils there. There is a question mark over their value in terms of the longevity, um, and perhaps that will come up uh, in discussion later. One of the most interesting developments in, in terms of installing trees within the urban environment, I think, that has come about recently has been the idea of structural cells. And these are cells that will take the loads of the surface. And we've got uh, there's the, uh, one green leaf. I think it's available through City Green here. I'm not, I think it might even be the same parent company. Somebody might be able to help me out with that. But it's called the strata cell anyway. Um, and that's the one, the sort of hexagonal one on the left-hand side there. They had a precursor to that, the root cell. And these cells lock together. Um, another, another example is the silver cell from the American uh, group, Deep Root. And, and they're put together, and the, the cells themselves take the load, the, the engineering loads necessary within the urban environment, and you fill those with uncompacted, good quality soil. Uh, and, and that can make a massive, massive difference to the rooting volume that's available to trees. Uh, because, they, yeah, they can be installed um, at, at the point of development and, and really can greatly enhance the rooting volume. And this is just a couple of graphics to sort of show you um, the idea. So you would have possibly two or three uh, cells deep and then across a whole large, well, swathe, swathe of pavement or underneath the pavement, and, and, and throughout the area, and that just generates a f accessible, de uncompacted soil for roots. They are quite expensive. You know, it's not a cheap option, and they're difficult to retrofit, although some people have tried. But if you can get in and uh, communicate with the landscape architects and really sh share a vision of mature trees, this is the sort of thing that we need to be getting engaged with uh, to ensure that trees can actually go on to survive and contribute uh, their full potential. So this is an example of the silver cell installation at uh, Myersco College that we did. Uh, you can see dug the pit and you can compact the base layer there. And you lay, we, we just had two deep, you can go up to three deep, um, and then you backfill those crates, if you like, empty crates, the cells with, with good quality soil, put some plates over the top, uh, and then you just... Uh, you know, can pave over the top or tarmac over the top or whatever, but you're confident that that's not going to uh, compact within that region, uh, despite the loads. Um, so that, that is, uh, and we, we, th there's the, the Acer Freemanii that we planted, and it's doing really, really fantastically well. There's also a little bit of scientific evidence that this works very effectively. Some of you might be familiar with the, the Bartlett tree group uh, out in... Um, 
North, North Carolina and near, near Charlotte. They've got a really impressive research facility there. And they did a fantastic study where they installed these trees in urban, in the urban plaza experiment, and they did different soil rooting options, okay? So you can probably just about make out the front rows the suspended pavement. Well, that's the cells I've just been talking about, okay? You can pick out something called stalite, maybe, which is a structural soil uh, and a compacted area. And you can see this is just a few years after the study that the suspended pavement, the good quality soil, in the structural, so uh, uh, structural cells uh, supporting the pavement is offering a much, much, much better root establishment and consequently growth for the tree. And a little bit later, a few years later, you can see that that's continued to be the case and there's a couple of new trees marked in there where they've actually had to replace the trees that have been in the, um, some of the other treatments. So there's that's probably the best experiment that there is that delivers data to say, actually, changing that rooting environment, making sure the, the root volume is correct um, for the, the size of tree that we, you want to plant can make a, a really significant contribution to how that tree establishes and, and then contributes to our landscape. And just to illustrate the point further, uh, I'll say it in a different way with a photograph again from Stockholm, but it's, it's just a, a great shot because you see the trees around the margin that have access to just a little bit more rooting space are doing much, much better than those ones in the isolated pits in the center of that parking lot where you can see at best they are much, much smaller and most of them are in decline, okay? It doesn't take science all the time to say these things. It just sometimes takes a little bit of observation and saying, okay, well, what is going on here? Why does the root environment matter so much? In Manchester, there was an interesting project done quite recently by a guy called Azraf Rahman, and he's allowed me to use his, his data, under Roland Enos's group, uh, that looked at the effect of rooting conditions on growth and cooling ability in uh, a particular variety of pear. And they, they planted out a whole load of relatively young, six-year-old pear trees in three different environments. So one was in pavements, one was in grass verges, one was using Amsterdam soil, which is a structural soil. And they, f they came up with some, some interesting findings. If we look here at the data on growth, and I hope you can all see it, Normally I'd point to these things, but I can't point to four screens at the same time, so I'll, I'll just have to des describe what I'm looking at. We see that the, the top left is height, top right is dBH, and then we have crown diameter and leaf area index. In all cases, where the rooting volume was effectively increased, if you like, and less compacted, so the Amsterdam soil offered the, the greatest rooting volume and the pavement the least rooting volume, and, and also other soil conditions, we, we see that the growth parameters were reduced under the pavement versus the, the structural soil. Uh, and the leaf area index, that's a measure of how dense the compaction is, sorry, not compaction, dense the canopy is. Um, so it had a, a really significant impact on on the growth. If we looked at the shear strength, which is very important for the elongation of roots and the proliferation of roots, we saw that it was much lower in the Amsterdam soil, so roots were able to proliferate more effectively in that soil than they were in um, the other, con the other um, sites, and the pavement and the grass verges. And that DBH and leaf area index were some, to some extent linked with this soil strength as well. So that's really good evidence that what we measure on the ground in terms of the you know, rooting environment can make a, a big difference on the, the growth and that we can link that. Certainly one of the things is, is the reduction in, in soil strength that we get with the, the structural soils. For, from their point of view, they wanted to look at the impact on cooling. They were interested in how trees can modify climate and the difference in terms of energy loss, cooling ability, 
was really marked. It went in parallel, if you like, with those reductions in growth. You'd expect a bigger tree to, that's doing well, that's growing effectively, transpiring more water, to contribute much more, wouldn't you? And well, here we have the evidence to demonstrate that's exactly the case. So all sorts of things that we expect trees to do in urban environments don't occur if they're just surviving. They only occur if they're really thriving, doing well, growing to their full potential. Another interesting example from the, the literature is from the, the Bayeus trees in Germany. This was a, a public art. This is a public art I, I can get on board with. I'm not often um, in favor of big public art projects, <laughs> but this, this is this what was one to plant 7,000 trees uh, over the course of, well, I think a few years in the early 80s. And they planted these, these oak trees and planes and various other trees all over the city. And they, they corresponded them to um, a plaque or I think a little bollard. And 30 years later, it's given really good evidence as to how the different environments that these trees got planted into have, has impacted their growth. So if we look, one of the things they looked at was the aeration. And, and the fancy sort of term for that is a gas diffusion coefficient. It's really how effectively gases can move between the soil and the atmosphere at a very low coefficient means we've got almost no gas exchange between the soil and the atmosphere. And as that coefficient increases, we've got really good exchange with the atmosphere. And we see here that the sealed, so tarmac sealed um, areas, this I'm looking now at the left-hand graph, has got an incredibly low gas co um, diffusion coefficient. Aeration is really, really impoverished. So we'd like to have carbon dioxide building up in the uh, rooting zone. As we move to macadamized road, which I actually had to look up, it's a sort of graded gravel surface. Okay, so it's not sealed, but it will be compacted and, and so on. Um, it's a little bit better, and then we move into the non-vegetated and vegetated state, and we get a, an increasing um, level of gas exchange between the soil and the atmosphere. And that was um, also correlated a similar sort of pattern with respiration rate. Respiration rate of the soil is a really good indicator of how much biological activity is going on within the soil from a, from a fungi, bacteria, root point of view. So that we can see that as the gas um, exchange becomes higher, uh, we also get an increase in respiration rate. We've got more biological activity. And that's a really essential um, characteristic for, for root growth and development. In fact, they measured that, so we have on the top three at different depths, we've got the gas um, diffusion coefficient measured against fine root density, and we can see that the fine root density always increases at each level as we get better gas exchange. Soil aeration is absolutely critical to getting root development, and that, in fact, also had a, a relationship with the DBH, so the diameter at breast height, and the tree height. So we know that it's affecting growth. This is really good data that you should be engaging with as arborists and saying, oh, this is evidence for why we should change the way we do things and not accept sealed surfaces near trees, not accept compaction near trees, and so on. These are a couple of images from a friend in Sweden. Believe it or not, the, the uh, tree on the left-hand side, probably 30 years old. Um, and the tree on the right-hand side is 40 or 50 years old. Okay? They're just in really shoddy root environments. And these trees somehow are surviving, but they're certainly not contributing a great deal um, to the landscape and the environment, all those ecosystem services that we talk about um, that the green infrastructure offers. Okay, root environment really has a very deep impact on tree development. So that's some material that I hope sort of gives a little bit of evidence as to why the root environment matters. We'll pick up a little bit more about soil compaction later on. But I want now to move to one of those other um, characteristics that I talked about, the plant quality side of things. And actually, you've got one of the best documents available to us in Australia, the uh, Ross Clark's um, little book on specifying trees is really, really helpful um, for getting good quality plant material. It's, of course, not brilliant for everything, but it's, it's a really good start 
for looking at some of the characteristics that are important. And stem taper and crown symmetry might be one of the things that you could actually specify when you um, require trees. One of the nurseries in the UK has got this scheme now where you can log on to their website and you can select the tree that you're going to buy based on videos like this. So every tree that comes through their system is barcoded and they video it before it goes out onto the nursery and, it, and you, can, you can log on and say, right, that's the tree that I want. You can actually see the quality of material that you're getting and you can say, this, this is what I require um, for my planting scheme. So that was a, a, a Pyrus caloriana and a Liriodendron, tulip tree. Again, these are these, you know, potentially big trees. You can say, okay, well, I want a nice uniform crown structure. I want a clear stem to a certain height. And I want to make sure that there's stem taper and so on. This is actually, I think, a really useful tool. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that if you've got 200 trees to install <laughs> on a um, development site or a, a big landscape architecture project that you go ahead and kind of click through every tree on the website and say, I'll have that one, that one. But actually, what you need to be doing is visiting the nursery and making sure that you're building up a relationship with the people that are selling you trees and that you're not standing for really poor quality trees that are likely to fail in the future. We need to be holding the nursery industry accountable to good quality standards that make sure that they deliver good quality trees. One of the other aspects that you need to be concerned about, of course, is the, the root uh, in quality of, of the nursery stock. And interestingly enough, Japan actually have, have a, a whole management philosophy that is born out of this single word, nemawashi, which is the uh, informal process of quietly laying down the foundation of some proposed project or change. It's a sort of the sort of background work you do with your wife or your husband when you want to buy a new car, or it's the sort of the, the sort of buttering up that you, you do perhaps with business associates if you're looking to go into a um, partnership together. Okay, and th this is born out of the process of going around the route because it's deeply ingrained in their culture that unless you prepare the route system for moving and this big event, this big change actually the likelihood of failure is much, much higher. So this is the sort of thing that if you pull apart root balls from nursery stock that you get incredibly impoverished root systems, structurally totally deficient. That top series, you know, there's almost no fine root material whatsoever. Yet there will be a kind of a wire cage or a container holding the soil onto the tree when you buy it. Okay, you could easily just lift the tree out, or you get containerized trees that have been in containers too long and they've circled around and the roots don't recover from that sort of treatment. It's been really poorly treated. But how many people really investigate that when they buy their trees and and and? importantly, send the stock back if it's not up to standard and say, I'm not going to accept that. It's difficult if you haven't had a standard or some sort of specification to hold the, the, the nursery to account with. But if you've got that, if you've included that within the contract, then maybe you've got a little bit of um, evidence that you can use, say, this isn't the quality that I've agreed to pay for. We know naturally that roots get injured all the time. They get injured through frost, through impact with um, rocks and stones, through herbivory. And actually, they're really good at recovering. Now, roots do re-establish their system quite nicely. They typically will have um, if the, uh, loss of the apical meristem. Uh, lateral meristems will take over that apical role in a similar way that you might see sprouting above ground. And it's a sort of schematic on the left there, but the, 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 the uh, red maple roots on the right was uh, taken from a photograph um, of an actual root system that recovered prior or, or after the injury had occurred. So you can see that the roots 
um, re-establish from the point of injury, they also keep going in the same direction, and that that's, um, can be quite important as well. So what we need to happen is that root pruning uh, at various distances from the stem occurs in sequence so that we get a finely branched root system rather than something that's just left to go impact the, the, the side of the container or, or is lost in, indeed in the transplanting process. Here's some pretty old data now, but it's, it illustrates the point nicely. You can see uh, roughly what the root ball you would get is. If you, if you prune the root ball, um, you get a much uh, higher root biomass within that root ball that you're retaining in transplanting than you would otherwise in the, in the lower image of an unpruned root system where you're losing the vast majority of those roots uh, and you're leaving them in the soil when you lift, lift it from the nursery. Uh, and indeed, uh, it's been demonstrated that about up to 98% of the root system can be lost in that way. So, uh, nemawashi, if you like, root pruning, ensuring that your root system isn't just a kind of, you know, a claw on the bottom of the stem um, is really critical. One of the ways we can get around that is by container, containerizing trees and I think you, the air pots are, you'll be familiar with over here. Uh, Bartram Trees uses uh, a white bag system. It doesn't really matter to some extent uh, how you do it, providing they're not in there too long. But it just allows the root system to recover a little bit from the field uh, transplanting before it gets out onto site. And generally speaking, uh, the containerized trees do have a, a better root system, particularly the, the air pot is, is very good at delivering a nice fibrous root system. So we can specify this sort of thing within our plant quality criteria. The root ball diameter should be a greater depth, um, should be um, greater than the root ball depth. So we've got a wider root system than we have um, a deeper root system. And the root development should be apparent in each quarter, if you like, of that root ball. So you're not getting a highly skewed root system that's only ever going to go off in one direction. So you're getting at least the potential for root proliferation in, in all directions. And I've just put a few other criteria here that you might want to look at. Things like graft compatibility, free from pests and diseases, free from uh, substantial injury, a good pruning wound occlusion, extensive fibrous root systems, um, uh, uh, free from root defects, and so on. There's a whole range of criteria that you can use uh, to specify the quality of tree that you acquire. I guarantee if, if all trees that came into our urban environment met these sorts of criteria, our establishment would certainly be better than it is. Planting practice, then. One of the things to get really right, is to make sure that your cultivated uh, planting pit is much wider, ideally at least two or three times wider than the root ball that you're planting. It's really critical to make sure that the depth of the plant uh, is th at the same level as the, the nursery, okay? Not to, not to put it too deep. I mean, put crudely, roots are designed to be underground, stems are de designed to be above ground. You get either one of those things wrong and it um, really does impact on the health of the tree a great deal. And there's, again, evidence in the literature, if you look at Mike Arnold's work and, and his associates, there's good evidence that um, putting trees even you know, um, five or six centimeters below the surface or below where they should be impacts on their subsequent growth and development. And of course, things like um, staking can be important, but not necessarily. It all depends on the context of, of, of the tree, but certainly getting the planting practice right is critical. What is absolutely essential is the, what we call root to soil coupling. So the ability of the roots to integrate into the new soil environment. And, and there's various things that can be important for that, of course bulk density is one, we'll, we'll explore that in some more detail later. Uh, having a mulch that's five to ten centimeters deep across that root zone really has a great uh, impact as well um, for all sorts of reasons that, again, we'll explore a little bit later. And I won't read this out. I, I think the, I'm right in saying the PowerPoints will be available, so I don't expect you to write these things down. But again, there's a whole 
range of specific specification criteria that you can have on your planting practices. I don't know how many local authority um, tree officers um, actually have a specification that their subcontractors, landscapers, need to meet that you can go back the following week and check that they've actually met, that they have put the mulch down to a particular depth, that the cultivated area is wider than the root ball, that the bulk density is, is you know, less than 1.2 or 1.3. You know, all of these things can be written into contracts, and I don't think that's really happening at the moment. And we're probably uh, doing a lesser job as a consequence of that. Okay, tree selection, I really sort of boiled it down to four different areas, two of which I, I consider the primary elements of tree selection, and then two of which I think are secondary but equally important. Well, no, they're not equally, otherwise it wouldn't be secondary, but um, they are lesser importance, but they need to be considered. Okay, so some of the constraints, the edaphic constraints of the site, the biological constraints, um, within the, the population of trees, the genotypic diversity within, in, within a population that can be quite important for future vulnerability to pests and diseases and all sorts of other things. The budget, practical availability. It's no good um, saying, right, well, I'd like this obscure maple from some region in China if it's not available to you. I mean, you can get really creative um, if you're a plantsman, but it's not always easy to practically deliver those trees uh, to the sites. We need to take into account uh, local conditions uh, within the ecophysiology. Is it able to cope with salt tolerance? Is it able to cope with cold or drought tolerance? Okay. What sort of space has it got? Um, what's the phenology of the tree? That could be quite important uh, for us to consider. Is it evergreen? Is it deciduous? What's the flowering time? All those sorts of things contribute to selecting the right tree. Under all of that, we have aesthetics. I put it underneath, really, because it kind of gets me that we select trees that bloom the most radically or have got the best autumn colour, often to the detriment of their ability to be able to survive within the urban environment or the context that you're putting in there, putting them in. And again, functional properties. I've thought about things like shelter, shade, landscape character that can be important uh, in some projects as well. So really we have this idea that we start off with our total available species pool and then these constraints act as almost like filters, and we reduce the number of species that are available as we um, you know, filter out the unsuitable trees. So those that aren't able to tolerate the drought might get filtered out, and those that aren't available to us might get filtered out. And then we're left with some that do have those properties that we're looking for, the aesthetic properties, and, and we then ultimately have an appropriate species pool from which we can select. If we go straight from the total species pool down into just what we think is going to look pretty on a site, again, our failure rates are going to get um, much higher. Right, well, I've, I'm going to um, move quickly. I think actually this, hey, how about that? Two minutes ago, and I just brought us back to that summary. If we don't have um, all of those things under consideration, our establishment rates, uh, will likely to be continued along the sort of 25% failure plus in many cases. So we, I, I think you can see if we take out any one of those elements from that um, diamond, if you like, we take out the, the, the good quality rooting environment, the plant quality, the planting it correctly, the, the tree selection, if we, if we ignore any one of those things, then we certainly struggle to get good establishment and we struggle to receive the ecosystem services that trees promise us for our landscapes. Okay, well, I think I'll leave it there. And are we having a break, Shane? Yes, we are. Good. Thank you.